Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Khawar Nassim, and I'm the Consul General of Canada in New York. And I'm delighted to be here with you this afternoon for the final session of today. Uh, I wanted to just share with you how excited we are to be with you. Uh, you know, now in its fifth year, this event is a cornerstone of our calendar and one that I look forward to every year. So I guess I guess it's a, it's it's an honor and, and in fact a tragedy to be joining you all virtually for this year's event. I would much rather have been doing this uh, in person. Bonjour tout le monde, je suis ravi d'être ici aujourd'hui avec vous tous. Uh, allow me to start by thanking our friends at the Economic Club of New York and the French Consulate General for their continued, I would say, friendship, partnership. Uh, you are great allies for us. I'd also like to thank our ASL interpreters from All Hands in Motion and our captioners from the Canadian Hearing Services for being with us today. I know you've covered a lot in the earlier sessions today, but I, I think I'm on pretty safe ground when I say that these two years, uh, these past two years, have been transformational in the way our economy works, the way we work, the way we relate to one another. And as we've heard from our speakers this morning, uh, women have borne the brunt of many of these challenges. Uh, the pandemic has widened disparities across our society for mothers, for immigrants, for people with disabilities, and for communities of color. While, uh, thank goodness, the, the economy is bouncing back, and I feel it every day in New York, for us to emerge and to recoup the losses from the pandemic, we're going to need real leadership. And that's what today's session is about. It's about hearing from leaders about how we chart a path forward to achieving gender equality. Now, for those of us in Canada, gender equity is a pillar of the way that we govern. And I'm, I'm really proud of the, the measures we've taken. This is our fifth year doing this event. But we do more than that. Um, Sarah mentioned this morning, universal daycare to me is a game changer. And I think it's going to be an enormous uh, um, positive for getting women more engaged and continuously engaged in the workforce. At a more local level, we run clean tech adventures for women. We, we run uh, specific innovation programs for women. In my department, for example, we're committed to appointing women to 50% of our ambassador posts. Another element of our economic recovery is forward-looking immigration policies to attract smart, capable people. In February of this year, we raised our immigration targets for the next three years with the aim of opening our doors in Canada to over 1.3 million new people. Those are ambitious targets. And for me personally, this is, this is something that resonates with me. I'm enormously proud of this program. My parents came to Canada in the 60s, and hard to believe, I know, but uh, I know firsthand that Canada has an open culture that supports the success and growth of its immigrants and refugees. The contributions of these new newcomers bolster our economy. They are a path to prosperity for our nation. Today we're going to be hearing from Rania Llewellyn. Uh, she is a testament to Canada's success in supporting women in leadership and fostering an inclusive culture for immigrants. Her story of rising through the ranks of what is a traditionally male-dominated industry to become the first woman to lead a major chartered bank in Canada can be an inspiration to all of us. I'm really looking forward to hearing from Rania and our other speakers this afternoon about how they are thinking about the future of women and work and how we are going to lead to greater equity at the C-suite level. To moderate this discussion, I'm, I'm really pleased to introduce Shelley Banjo, New York Bureau Chief at Bloomberg. Shelley is a leader in her own right, overseeing more than 1,200 journalists at the company's headquarters in New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. She also sits on Bloomberg's Equity Task Force and covers business and technology news with a special focus on the popular video sharing app, TikTok. Uh, thanks again for all of you for being a part of this session. I think it's going to be wonderful, and I'll hand it over to you, Shelley. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, and I'm so excited to, to have all of you all of you here. Um, I want to open up um, and go over to Janice to talk about um, 
some advice that you might have. So obviously you you all three have such uh, long careers in um, male dominated industries based on your experience over your entire career, but especially over the last two years uh, during the pandemic, what's the one piece of advice um, you'd give to women who aspire not just to exceed um, and excel in their careers, but to really to join the C-suite? So, um... Thank you very much. It's, I'm delighted to be here and with my colleagues to share stories. You know, I think women have an enormous opportunity to be great leaders going forward. And the reason I say is that because in the executive search world where I am now, but I spent nearly 20 years in corporate America as well, and now in search, women bring attributes and leadership qualities to the C-suite and the boardroom that are just really unique. And it's about a lot of compassion and nurturing and focus on DEI. So I think the opportunity is definitely there for women and more so today than ever before. I, you know, I think one of the things that women need to do early on in their careers is when they're getting, they're getting out of college is to really make sure that they're connecting with people because the network that you develop then is the network that's really going to take you far in the future. And I think that's one of the things that women do do well. Um, and I think furthermore, the other thing that in corporate America is really important is to have an advisory group to, for women to get feedback about how am I doing? Mayor Koch many years ago used to walk around New York City saying, how am I doing? Well, I think that's really important for women to know how are they doing and how can they succeed in the, in the corporate environment, which is still dominated by men. So those are some of the things I would say. And then the other is women as leaders getting out of your comfort zone, but not taking on something that you know nothing about, but taking on projects within your organization that can really help you move ahead are really important as well, because then you really are showing that you're not just swimming in one lane, but you're swimming in many lanes. And the last thing I would say is that women as a group need to help other women along with making sure that they have sponsors and champions, men and women, to help them succeed in the future. So those are some tips of many, over many years, but then the last two years, I think the opportunities are enormous for women going forward. When you talk about the advisory groups and the champions, do you mean just within your company or do you, do you mean across your industry or across different industries? Oh, I mean, internally and externally. That's a great point, Shelley, because I think that one of the things I always say is it's not necessarily who you know, it's who knows you. So who knows you means you have to be out there with a voice and you have to be uh, speaking at conferences, with whatever your expertise is, uh, and writing, you know, thought pieces, uh, being on social media in a really good way. But it's internally and externally. In my own career, I early on um, chaired a foundation, I'm sorry, chaired, uh, chaired a professional association. I was president of it in my 20s and, you know, then went on to chair uh, a very large uh, not-for-profit in New York City and now on the national board. I wrote two books about how women can move up the corporate ladder and um, started something with the Women's Forum of New York, which was about um, for breakfast of corporate champions, honoring those companies that are above the national average for women on their board. So being out there, now that's over a long period of time, my career, but being out there and being visible is really important. And that's what I think women need to do. And I wanna bring uh, Dominique in here too with the, with the same question. Um, what's your best piece of advice do you think for women who not only aspire to move up in their careers, but specifically to join the C-suite? Um, we are managing a firm in private equity, as you know, and, and real assets, and we have a, a lack of uh, female candidates in private equity. Uh, so we are very proactive. So we need and we are organized to go to universities, to school, to promote finance and to convince them that they could have, they can have good careers. Uh, so it's very early on in the process uh, that we need to be proactive because if we wait uh, to hire women who are already, let's say, 30s or 28, it's not enough. So we need to go and see students of 20, 18 years old and to promote and, and, uh, and in order to get 
uh, first for training programs. So we want, because we have a lot of trainees and we need to, we want to have at least 50% from diversity and 50 others, at least. Um, and then we want also for each job to try to hire women. But so we need to do it very, very early on. Uh, then once they joined, um, I fully agree with Janice, uh, you need to follow their career path uh, very, uh, very narrowly because some of them can be a little shy, um, not enough demanding. Uh, so you need in fact to, to follow their careers um, and to every time there is a promotion uh, to really ask the question whether you should promote her or him and balance. So it's, it's, you need to push a lot um, to achieve, to have at the top level then 20 years or 15 years later, 40% uh, or 50% of women. Uh, in the investment teams, we have in France 26% of women. So it's increasing. Uh, globally at the firm, we have more 20, if we consider all offices, we have 50% of women in the company. So it's a bigger weight in support function. Um, but we are making progress. Uh, we, we got recently the Edge Access Certificate patient, so which is very good. And we need to renew the certification every two years. But my, as a summary, I would say you need to be very proactive. It's not done. It's, it's, it's a, I, I fully agree with Janice. It's a better time, much better time for, for women uh, currently because uh, at boards, you know, uh, uh, even at boards, uh, some investment banks refuse uh, to make IPOs uh, of companies uh, which don't have 40% of women at the board. So this is a big plus. Um, but for the career inside the company, you need to go to the university to find the right students um, and then to promote your own business. And for the time being, private equity is, I would say, is not attracting uh, enough women. So we hope it will make progress in the coming years. You mentioned something about women, some women being shy. I'm, I'm curious, just as a follow-up, how do you make sure that it's the best person who gets promoted rather than the loudest person? As, as you mentioned, it's not always the woman who's advocating for, for herself. For you as a business leader in your own business, um, how, how do you make sure of that? I, I have a good example for you. We created a women's club at Ardian and we organized session around countries. So we have a Women uh, session for Asia, women session for you know Northern Europe, US, and it's a good opportunity because they ask many questions, and you know you would be surprised because some of them <laughs> even say, "How do I ask for an increase of my remuneration?" I say, "You go to go your boss and you ask." <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's um, I think the, the, there is something. Um, you know, I, I don't like to make, to make difference, but women in the working environment are very oriented on the success, success of what is done, okay? Success is, is done even globally in a team. It's a team success, okay? Uh, and as such, you know, as they are happy, they are satisfied. So you, I don't know if it is a French attitude, I'm sorry, because I know more about the French culture. But so you need to push them also to, to be more individual and to ask things for themselves because they are very happy. It's a success. We won and they are very happy. So it's, it's, and, and, and it's very easy for me uh, as a CEO and founder of this company, I mean, to, women, to manage women is, is easier because they are often more pleased by success and less demanding. Um, but to go, because if you enter a company at 20, 22, 23, um, at 35 or 37 in, in, in private equity, you can have very large responsibilities because you have already a big experience. 
So the, the career path is quite short. I don't, I'm not telling you that you cannot embrace his career later, but if you come early and you do your best for the first 15 years, then you can really achieve great uh, responsibilities and a very interesting position with international uh, mindset, uh, et cetera. So I don't know if I answer your question, but um, you need to push, you need to, it's, it's a challenge and it's a good challenge and it's working well because afterwards the diversity in teams is excellent. The result is much better, much better. I see it everywhere. Great, I wanna bring uh, Rania in here to talk a little bit, uh, push forward a little bit on uh, recruiting and, and re re recruiting and retaining diverse talent. So obviously we've all looked around, we've, we're all probably seeing people uh, to the left and to the right of us end up uh, either resigning, going on to a different, going into a different job. A lot of folks have called it the, the great resignation. Uh, as an employer, what are you doing specifically to recruit, to not only recruit, but also to retain your top, top tier talent? That's great. Thanks, Shelley. I'm delighted to be here today and uh, delighted to be uh, part of an esteemed panelist. So uh, with Janice and Dominique, um, maybe if I can just address the first question first and then get into the second question that you asked. And so um, so listen, I, I think uh, I think I'm a testament. I've, I've switched jobs in the middle of covid. I joined an institution. I, I had worked for one bank for 26 years and switched jobs in the middle of a pandemic, not knowing a single soul, uh, didn't know the management team haven't even actually physically met my entire board of directors uh, in the middle of COVID and have been able to change culture. And so my advice to women is take chances. If you don't take risks, uh, you know, great things won't happen. And similar to what Dominique and Janice were saying is that nobody wakes up out of bed thinking about your career, but you. So you have to think about what you're going to do about your career and, and you have to take action. Uh, and so that would be my advice in terms of get out of your comfort zone and take risks. I was, uh, it was interesting as I was trying to recruit more diverse people at my management team, I replaced six out of my eight leaders, uh, how uh, little risk women were prepared to take at these leadership, because it's a transformational business. It's a bank that needs uh, to be pivoted. And so it was interesting for me to, to try to recruit people at that level and trying to convince them versus a lot of the, uh, a lot of the other, uh, the other uh, gender were very happy to jump in and take those risks. So just to answer your other question, um, so as uh, Kawar said, I was an immigrant. I, I found it and I came to Canada, very different cultural clash to be, to be honest, coming from the Middle East to Canada where just a little bit more direct. Uh, and so cultural differences come, diversity comes in different forms, not just gender, but you know, way of thinking, cultural backgrounds and so on. And so I would say is when I was trying to find a job early on in my career, my name was not Llewellyn. I couldn't even get past an interview. And so, you know, making sure that as we recruit a couple of things internally that we've started doing is don't go recruiting from the same schools that you've gone to or your management team has gone to. To get a diverse pool of talent, you need to broaden that, right? And so go to different schools, different backgrounds, different educations. That's how you're going to be able to attract more talent. And so, so that's one, one key thing. The other thing that I introduced since joining uh, the bank a year ago was putting, I'm a big believer in targets. What doesn't get measured does not get done. And so started by putting them in our balance scorecards under culture and leadership, specific targets by gender, by level, by you know BIPOC, so black, indigenous, and people of color. And just like your report on a PNL from a numbers perspective every month and every quarter to the board and to the street, we report on that every single quarter. So again, why do we treat that any differently? than actual you know, financial, financial results. And so retention, I, I find the recruitment is the easy part. That's the diversity, it's, it's a check mark, it's a statistic. Everyone can say they're doing well on that front. The most important part, which I think Janice and Dominique uh, alluded to is really the retention and the promotion aspect of it. Because that's where really, you know, a lot of women start dropping off. And, and so making sure that you have systems in place, you've got mentorship programs, you've got sponsorship programs, and you're putting your brightest women on projects that necessarily don't go to women, right? Uh, give them PLs. So don't put them always in corporate functions, whether it be in HR and operations, right? Like so, 
private equity is a great example of that. Like we need more women leading PNL organizations. And so making sure that that's part of not just the target, but also from a, from a retention perspective. And what I always say is uh, you should be constantly recruiting your talent because if you're not, somebody else is recruiting that talent. And then adding some promotional targets as well. And so that'll get people because until the leaders change, they're still the men. And so how are they assessing that talent to ensure that you're using the same criteria for, you know, potential uh, versus ability? And so, you know, having been in the, you know, on the receiving end where it's like, you know what, we're going to move you one more time to try to test you on this. We're going to move you one more time versus, you know, men are promoted on a lot of times for potential rather than uh, based on experience and ability. And so, so I think organizations need to move, remove some of these systemic biases internally. And that's kind of what we're creating is uh, targets, metrics, but also uh, programs in place to make sure that people are trained. We've launched unconscious bias training. We've mandated it across the organization, both in management as well as at the board. And we talk about it openly. And so people know uh, if there are candidates that are brought to the table and it's, it's a man. And yes, it's a man who is going to be selected. They know they're going to get a call from me to find out who was in your pool. How did we actually uh, interview them? Was it a diverse panel that interviewed them? And so that, that puts the accountability on the hiring manager as well. Why is it so important to give women a PL? Because numbers speak louder than anything else. I, my, my career has been successful, to be honest, Shelly, because you know, otherwise it becomes a team sport, as Dominique was saying, right? It's easy to say, well, you know what, it was a team, we worked on this. It's, it's not as tangible as numbers. And so that's how we reward people. It's, it's the same as going to school. When you go to, when you're in school early on in, in grade school, you get a grade and that's a number. That's an actual tangible number. How did you rank and how did you perform relative to your competitors? And so I think numbers never lie. Data is data. And so it's a great opportunity to be able to actually prove yourself and remove a lot of the other ambiguous uh, ways of measuring people's performance. So I think it's really, really important to give them that opportunity. And I want to move on to another question, but before I do, I want to ask you, uh, why did you decide to take a chance in the middle of the pandemic and, and leave a 20 plus year career? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question, Shelley. I was one of the top 30 of a 100,000 organization. Um, and when I got the call, my initial response was no, uh, thank you. Um, but then I kind of dug a little bit deeper and I said, okay, so a couple of reasons, number one, maybe I was going through a midlife crisis, but I said, uh, listen, it's a CEO of a, of a sked one chartered bank in Canada. I'd be the first woman to, to lead that organization. So when is that going to happen? Um, so why not? Number two, um, uh, the fact is I've always liked transformational businesses. I like businesses that are underperforming, because I always say there's only one way and it's up, it's not going to go down any further. So why not? And then third, it was really the opportunity to bring in my own management team. There were a lot of vacant positions. And so uh, being able to uh, make an impact and transform an organization at a much faster pace was really, really attractive to me. I would say those were the three key reasons why I joined. Fascinating. Um, Dominique, I want to go back to you to talk a little bit about flexible work models. So during the pandemic, we know many offices have shifted to remote work or adopted different flexible schedules. Uh, here in New York, it's a, you know, it's a lot of push-pull, especially among the banking and private equity businesses about whether or not people want to be in the office or whether or not they need to be in the office or not. Uh, as an employer, where do you think we're heading with this and, and how has it changed your workforce? your workforce is changing quite fast <laughs> um, last year uh, because of covid we had to uh, draw policy of uh, home working and after let's say two months of study we ended with one year one day sorry of home working one day a week uh, we are now in march and in March, we are seeing that many companies are giving two days a week. And in New York, apparently, some companies have fully adopted Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday at the office, and Monday and Friday at home. So in six months, 
it's a big change because from one day of homeworking to two days of homeworking, and when it was one day, people could choose the day. Now, I mean, because it's two days, um, and I think the trend will be difficult to, to stop. I don't know if it's positive or negative. This is another issue we see. We will see it in two, three years from now. But then you, it will be so messy if you leave everyone decide what day, okay? So this new organization, let's say, future organization, uh, first will create some inequality between big groups. Why? Because in finance, quite easy, you can work from home. But if it is a manufacturer, uh, I'm at the board of Hermes. I mean, you, you need to have workers. You need to have people who do the bags, who do the, uh, the scarf, to do everything. Um, and so it's, it's more difficult in that kind of company uh, to have those two days of home working because then you will have two different population. Population who can work from home and the population who can't work from home. So if I stay only in my business of finance, uh, which is easier for home working. Um, what does that mean? It means, and uh, I can ask Janice, but um, when we speak to some headhunters, they say you are no longer competitive if you don't propose two days of home working. Mm -hmm. And Argent is a company which is growing fast. So we need to hire more people, a lot of more people and young people. So if they say no, uh, two, two days of working. So I think the trend is there and I will be very happy to listen to Janice on that. Um, whether it will be positive for women or not positive for women, I don't know. I, I must stay modest. I don't know. What we, are, we were doing also before last year was to, um, to have a paternity leave of six weeks uh, which was a revolution in Japan and in some other countries. So we had to, to see whether it was legal or not to impose or to encourage, let's say, six weeks. I think this is good. This is good. Now, when we, you have couples, uh, suppose that all the companies, all the finance business is going to three days a week uh, and the couples is at home for Monday and Friday, uh, the organization, which was the one during COVID, um, and oh, some people complain because you need quite a big apartment, you need some place to, to work quietly, and if your kids are around, it's not so easy. So because of my maturity, I would say it this way, I think we need to be practical. If the society currently is going to two days home working, we, we must be on track, otherwise we won't hire young people. Then I think we will see how this is adopted and adapted over the next two, three, four years. I like the fact that people will be together at least three days a week and that they will have one office because flexible offices, if you, if you combine home working, and flexible offices, this, is, this can be tricky because you don't know where your colleague is on which floor. And so when you come Monday, Tuesday, maybe you will run all around to find him or her, okay? So uh, within Arjun, I am in favor of home working. Let's see how people are happy with that once they have adopted that. And I'm less in favor of flexible offices. I do want to bring Janice in. What, what are you hearing from the um, employers that you're working with? And um, do, do you see it helping or benefiting uh, attracting female talent? It's interesting. <clears throat> you know, the closer you are to the CEO and the C-suite, the more they still want you there. Uh, and I don't know if you're finding that, Rania and Dominique, but <clears throat> if you're going to be reporting to the CEO or reporting to somebody who reports to the CEO, there's still... They want the cadence of you being there for the meetings. Uh, yes, maybe three days a week or every other week, but the closer you are, they really want you to then relocate. So relocation has not gone away. And I think part of this is to say, I want you there to really 
when you're hiring people, assimilate them into the organization. And while we've been productive, maybe we haven't been as efficient because we're not right next door to each other, right? Can't walk down the hall. You have to pick up the phone. You have to send an email. So, um, you know, three years ago, we were all in the work site five days a week. This is like, this is new, but it's taken a new hold and there is a new reality. So when I'm working with my clients, I'm saying, and this is both men and women who don't necessarily want to relocate um, or can't travel there every week. So I have to talk with my clients about, you know, what what's a um, non-negotiable here? You know, can they commute? They have a sophomore or a junior in high school. Can they commute for a year? So you're really talking about how to make it work best for both parties, right? So I think every individual case there's, is different. And so we try and work that through. You know, I've, I've spoken to one woman for a very top job who a uh, single mother in Texas and she has to go to Chicago and and she's not going to relocate because it would be the worst thing because all of her care is there, her parents and, and, and others. So, and the employer knows that. So that's fine. But I think there's other things besides the relocation or the flexible. It's really about a well-being. And I think, Rania, you talked about this earlier. Individuals want to go to companies that are purpose-driven. They are focused on people, processes, and the planet. They want to know that you really care about them, and then they will be able to have an impact at your organization. They are looking for that purpose-driven organization that's really going to benefit society. And, you know, they may not make the move, or they may not relocate, or they may not be at the same cadence in the beginning. But if you have all of those things in your company and a great leader who's caring and compassionate and communicative and committed to that company and its people, they may move, they may make the move. So it's really about, you know, you're aligning your values with the employer you're going to go to. And if they are aligned, and ESG comes into this too, particularly with the younger generation, that they're not, they're just not going to go to any company. They're really going to evaluate. And who's at the top? Are there women that look like me? Are there uh, ethnic backgrounds that look like me, religious, age, all of those things. Does that company reflect me? And really visionary CEOs are saying, I know I need to reflect the four legs of the stool, as I call them, my employees, my customers, my communities, and my shareholders. And I put shareholders last because if you do the first three, shareholders will want to buy your stock. They'll want to be behind you. So I think it's a very complicated issue. And I think each individual case, you have to look at it. But if a company has that philosophy at the top of really caring about the planet, processes, and people, they will attract the best and the brightest. And they will go either to the cadence of those meetings and or make a move. You think, and Shelly, if you don't mind, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was, no, I was just going to ask Janice real quick. Do you think four or five years ago, that woman in Texas, it would have just been a non-starter? Do you think at least now, every, at least it's, it's a conversation for everyone? Uh, it might have been a non-starter because I would have told her she shouldn't make the move. I mean, I, I do recognize that, you know, it has to be a marriage that's going to last for a long time. And so it has to fit both parties. It has to be a win-win, whether it be compensation, location, the job itself. And I think that's the other thing that people really need to make sure that they're going into a job that really reflects what they want to do. So, yeah. Uh, Ron, were you going to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to jump in on the future uh, of work models because uh, I've taken it a totally different uh, different direction. And maybe it's because I joined in the middle of COVID and ran a bank from my kitchen table. So we actually decided to um, start working from home first model. So it's a first from home work model. Uh, and uh, we're working, working with our teams. We have an entire program project led by my uh, head of uh, HR, my chief uh, human resource officer called the future of work, where we're serving our employees, we're working them on the future hybrid models that we're looking at, because it's not going to be one size fits all, like Dominique said. Um, but we actually committed to reducing our head office corporate space by 50%. And we announced it last week that we actually released 50% of our corporate offices here in Toronto. 
And so what we're seeing is I now can attract people. I'm not limited to where my real estate assets are. It's wherever the talent is. And so, for example, my head of ESG is, you know, a five hour flight away from from Toronto. And that's absolutely okay. I have my head of marketing who's on the other side of the country. And so that's so to me, that's that was a decision that we made strategically in terms of what do we need offices for? It's for culture, it's for onboarding, it's for collisions, it's for team building activities, maybe ideation. Um, and yes, it will make it a lot more complicated because it's a lot easier if we're all in the office or everyone is at home. Um, but that's what, as, as Janice was saying, uh, that's what talent, future talent is demanding. It's beyond, it's seeing beyond numbers, which is actually our tagline. It's like, what's your purpose? What's your culture? Uh, I want the flexibility. What we're seeing is that most people have actually moved out of the core cities. And so they don't want to commute. They don't want to be stuck in traffic for three hours, right? And and I, I, I publicly openly say, I like being able to see my kids for dinner uh, now. I see them a lot more for dinner than I ever did before when I was in the office five days a week. And so I do think as long as you can create an equitable environment, and I think that's going to be the trick. Men and women both want to work from home and they want that flexibility. But I think as a, as a company, you need to be clear on what that culture and value is. And as Janice said, then there's a marriage of those two cultures in terms of the needs of the employees, as well as the needs of the organization. And sometimes it's not going to fit. And I think that's okay to say, you know what, we're not the culture for you. It's not going to work. Do you think that helped you hire um, all the C-level executives you said you had to, uh, when you had to fill the bench there? Yeah, I think I think it was a number at the C-suite. Uh, there were a couple of things at the time we hadn't made the decision that we're going to have that model. We were all in the middle of COVID. I joined 14 months ago, 15 months ago. So that wasn't really the decision making. Um, but but as Janice said, representation matters. And so painting that purpose and that, you know, North Star for people in terms of where I wanted to take the institution. I think that definitely played a role. And you hire different individuals for different cycles in a business. And we're in a transformational cycle. So I was looking for entrepreneurs prepared to take risks. I actually told them you're going to have a great title. You're going to have great comp, but you know, you're going to be a janitor during the day. You're going to have to roll up your sleeves and, and work hard for everything. So that brings a very different caliber of people. So I think you need to be clear on what you need uh, for different business cycles as you're recruiting. Beyond the flexibility of office or not office, do you think that there's more um, businesses could be doing to retain working parents? And Ronnie, I'll start with you. And um, I'd love to hear uh, from Dominique and, and Janice after that. Yeah, I think in terms of working pay parents, I think, to be honest, le you need a change in mindset and leadership. The, the, the thing is, historically, and I can talk for in the financial industry, you know, people like to walk the floors. FaceTime was important, right? And so women were disadvantaged in terms of, I got to go pick up my kid from daycare. So all of a sudden they're not in the office when the big boss is walking around. Uh, and so it really starts with that change in mindset, trust. And I think that's what working from home has really forced leaders uh, is to start trusting their employees that, you know what, they're actually doing and they are being productive working from home. Working from home doesn't mean that you're slacking off. Uh, you know, and then and then understanding that they don't have to be, you know, if I send an email, they don't need to respond right away. And so I think our working habits need to change the way we uh, have these discussions. You have to also be delivered in, in terms of your touch points. Historically, you only collided with those that were either on your floor or close proximity or people that you liked versus in this model where you have to set up one on ones. You have to be a little bit more deliberate as a leader. You have to have career conversations. So you're looking for different leadership skills. So, so to make it equitable and to set it up for success, we need to start with our leaders and making sure that they understand that what they need is not necessarily what the future talent needs. Uh, and so, so I, think, I think those are really, really important uh, is to not assess people based on what we think is you know, the way of working, but it's what does the future of working look like? And let's, let's measure them based on productivity and regular check-ins and that comes with accountability and so you need to make sure that they are delivering and that they are you know uh they're accountable for their productivity as well but i think you need the leaders as well as the employees to understand the new rules and rules of engagement going forward in this hybrid model 
And Janice, what about you? What, what kinds of things are you seeing companies do to retain working parents? What, what, what seems to be working? So, you know, I think, um, again, it is the marriage of the, you know, the values of each um, and their, their policies. The policies have changed. You know, they've given uh, special amounts of money to parents for daycare or other things, education for their kids. And so I think the policies that have changed during this period have been dramatic. Um, and TIAA CREF and uh, Netflix and all of the big leaders out there really came forward and some personally gave money for education of the children and or of that worker who needed to get to the next rung. So I think that the all of the policies, I think having been a chief human resources officer at one point in my life, I think the Shro role has just been under such pressure over the last two years from going overnight virtually to a virtual workplace, you know, it's incredible that that has been able to happen with the HR leaders that are out there. And so they have looked at all of their policies for working parents, uh, people who have elderly parents at home, you know, that also need care, some who got COVID, put them, putting them up at hotels, and I know of companies that have done this so that they could be close to their parent who was in a hospital. So I think so many things have happened to really overhaul policies. And it is a new reality. There's no doubt about it. Um, and I do think, as Ronnie was just saying, it takes a new type of leadership. And that's one of the reasons that the recruiting profession, not just my firm, but so many have been so busy because we had many new CEOs. I think the number was, I've had it recently, quite a number of new CEOs during the pandemic. They had no playbook. You know, they, they had to just rise to the occasion. And then they looked around to see who was sitting next to them at their table. And they realized they didn't have the right leaders there. So they really, there's been a big shift in terms of the C-suites in corporate America of the C CEO, as well as his or her direct reports. Uh, so I'm encouraged by all of this that is happening because I do think our leaders have, have risen to the occasion for the most part. And if not, smart boards put in the right leaders. And, you know, I was listening to a um, session before about France being number one of women on their boards at over 55 percent. So the U.S. is number 16, uh, tied with Malaysia and South Africa. So that's going to change too. And new boards being refreshed are going to also demand that CEOs make sure that they have the best and the brightest talent and diverse talent. And that, as Rania was saying, boy, if you didn't interview people on a slate that were diverse and you put in a Caucasian man, you're going to get a call from me. Well, I want to see more CEOs do things like that because that is accountability. So boards have to be accountable. The C-suite has to be accountable. And to your the long-winded answer to your question, the policies have to be responsive to the best and the brightest talent, married couples or, or not, women in general and underrepresented groups especially. We need to bring in, I just want to make one point on that. I think Corporate America is really, really, really needs to work on bringing more diverse candidates into the lower levels, over hire there, train, mentor, sponsor, and bring them up into the organization so that they do get to the SVP and C-suite level and then can go on boards. Because when I'm asked to find an African-American woman to for institutional sales globally for 5,000 people, you know what? There aren't too many out there. We, we need to really train and bring uh, underrepresented groups and women up the corporate ladder. And Dominic, what about you for your business? Do you, you think there's more that, um, you know, you, you personally and then your industry and, and just generally, do you think that that could be doing to retain, um, to help retain working parents? Um, you know, on the, on the diversity, um, issues, uh, we have engaged with our peers in many, many initiatives because we think also we need a collective uh, um, battle. And, and so we have, uh, uh, we are now part of what we call Level 20, which is an organization dedicated to improving gender diversity in Europe. We join also the ILN, I'm sure you, you heard about it, um, investor Leadership uh, Network, which is promoting also diversity. 
Uh, we are, of course, a member of ILPA, uh, Diversity in Action Initiative. Um, and we've also created an urgent circle of executives because, as you know, private equity, we are investing in companies. So it's not only at Ardian, but and so this is creating a community of CEOs um, uh, and to um, encourage them to have this uh, diversity uh, map on, on their roadmap. And um, so I, I think we work a lot on that. I am very optimistic. Uh, I've seen progresses in the last two years, which I've never seen in my life, I must say. Uh, so I'm very optimistic on the fact that we will reach uh, all the KPI uh, for diversity that we, that we want if we, we go on like this, uh, whether people will be at home. I, I fully agree also with Rania that, uh, but it's a big change of uh, mindset <laughs> to think that the core is not the real estate and don't tell that to my real estate team, uh, but the core is a talent. I love to hear that myself because I've always been more focused on human beings than on anything else. Um, but it's what you say is totally true. Uh, we are focused on talents and there are talents everywhere. And I like also what you said, Rania, about uh, uh, having people from various universities, schools, you know, one of the past, I, I'm not here to say to criticize France, but one of the weakness of France on the last 50 years has been often to have people running France and companies from the same schools and, you know, in kind of elite. And uh, this has not proved a very, very good. Um, so um, I think we are on a good track, Shelley, uh, still work on, on to do, but um, I am very optimistic for women on the next uh, few years, whether it's at home, not at home. I think it's, it's very positive. And what about access to capital? Um, how are you helping entrepreneurs, um, women, uh, female entrepreneurs to kind of help level the playing field and expand women's access to capital? This is the most difficult of your question. Uh, we have even to be more proactive, but it's not easy. We, we have a growth uh, fund and we, we, we try very hard to find uh, small companies uh, headed by women, but there are few, very few, very few. Um, we, I see now more women at the top of big companies. You have women at the top of Oracle, GSK, many big companies. And in France also, I, I think three or four women are now at the top of the biggest 40 French companies. Uh, but for the startups, I don't, I have not analyzed why, but it's quite difficult. It's quite difficult. Uh, I have, I don't know if Janice or, or Rania have explanation. And it's not a question of equity or capital. I can tell you, they would, they would have thousands of money or more, millions, uh, to, to launch new startups or to do new business. Um, but it is, it is difficult. We have, huh? we have in France, we have some women, fortunately, but it's not enough. And Brenner, what about you? What do you think could help advance the, um, expand women's access to capital? Yeah, I, I think, I think Janice talked about it early on from a career perspective, but I think it also applies to women entrepreneurs is having the right network, having the right advisory boards, connecting them with the right, uh, lenders and so on. Um, we just launched our, our three-year strategic roadmap uh, in December, and one of our key pillars is making the better choice. And, and for that, that's embedded in all the decision-making that we do. And so one of the key things that we've done is we've embedded uh, some of that in, for example, our vendor selection processes, our partnership processes. So for example, recently we just announced uh, we're partnering up with a fintech that specializes in a visa solution end-to-end, -end, and it's led by a female immigrant, right. single mom. And so it, it not only does it address all of our financial needs that we need, but it also, it, it, it helped us make the better choice in terms of supporting a female entrepreneur. So we're embedding that kind of thinking in how we do business uh, across the board. Uh, but I do think, you know, having come from the bigger banks, 
at the end of the day, you know, you need people on the ground who are female relationship managers reaching out. And so you need a network, you need that support network. Um, and they need to, they need to own some of that and institutions need to own some of that as well. So, so that we can meet halfway there. Great. Well, I think we are uh, just approaching time here. So thank you all so much for joining us. I really appreciated uh, your insights. It was a really interesting conversation. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. And hello, everyone. I'm John Williams. I'm president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and I'm chair of the Economic Club. Now, first, I'd like to thank um, those who just participated in this final panel of the day. It's been a great set of panels. But with this panel, I'd like to uh, thank Janice Ellig, uh, Dominique Seneke, Aranya Llewellyn, and Shelly Banjo. So thank you for such a fantastic conversation. Your insights and perspectives as leaders around the world set the tone as we close out the day and think about these issues going forward. And I will say over the past hour, I have been writing notes and all the topics and ideas that you've been sharing. And I think these are great themes for the club to continue uh, these uh, conversations. And that brings me to the Economic Club of New York. We play an, an important role in convening these types of critical and timely conversations with thought leaders and change makers. And today's event has been a really great example of that. We spoke today about urgent issues that women are grappling with in the business world, from the role of workplace culture and technology to issues of gender equality in the workplace and beyond. And these, these conversations are incredibly important, especially as we move forward in the recovery from the pandemic and have new ways of working. It's especially significant that we heard from leaders from around the world. This global perspective allows us to learn from each other's experiences, challenges, and successes. I would like to thank uh, Kawar Nassim, Acting Co Consul General of Canada in New York, Jeremy Robert, Consul General of France, and Barbara Van Allen, our Economic Club, Club President and CEO, and their teams for their tireless efforts to make today's event happen, as well as all the speakers who gave their time today, especially given uh, everyone's varying time zones. Now, the Economic Club has some exciting events coming up, so I can't help but mention those. So uh, for our members and any guests who are interested in becoming a member, please be sure to contact the club for more information. And you can do that by emailing info at econclubny.org. Again, thank you all for all of you for joining today. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Stay safe.